Hi. So today, um, Dr. Goswami and I will be presenting our recent work regarding the application of molecular diagnostics to stain cytology smears. Um, I will present the clinical relevant part pertaining to obtaining cytologic material, uh, choice of lesions, and choice of mutations, uh, and the result, uh, while Dr. Goswami will focus on the particular methodology used to detect this molecular alteration. So um, the learning objectives of today are to understand the processing of cytological samples and how it relates to molecular diagnostics. Uh, we will go over the benefits of using cytology smears for molecular diagnostics, uh, then the details of Q-clamp technology, and uh, uh, briefly mention the potential for use of cytology samples for development of future molecular applications. So the method, the method of obtaining tissue samples by cytology from solid lesions is called fine needle aspiration, or FNA. FNA is a minimally invasive tissue collection approach consisting of inserting a very thin needle it's usually a 26 gauge needle, a little bit bigger than the needle that's used to draw blood. Uh, that can be done with CT or, or ultrasound guidance, uh, but if the lesions are palpable, it can be done without guidance. Uh, once the needle is in the lesion, it's moved back and forth several times uh, to allow cancer cells or other cells in the sample to uh, travel via capillary action up the needle. Uh, once the cells are within a hub of the needle, we stop the procedure, and then the material can be uh, processed, can be either smeared on glass slides or expelled uh, into a test tube. So um, FNA, or final aspiration method, is a preferred method for sampling uh, lesions that uh, have, they are prone to bleeding, like thyroid lesions, and for uh, um, tissue collection from patients who have advanced disease uh, or who are uh, not, uh, not good candidates for more aggressive uh, procedures. So once we obtain material by fine aspiration, we can either, as I mentioned before, smear it on glass slides. The slides are fixed then and stained, either with a Papa Nicolaou stain or another stain which we call Difquick or Romanovsky. Papa Nicolaou stain allows us uh, to analyze the, the cell nuclei, nuclear beetle, in, uh, very well, while diff quick stain allows uh, us to analyze the cytoplasm and the, the background. Um, the material can also be expelled uh, into a test tube and then fixed either with a cytology fixative, which is usually a mix of carbowax and ethanol. Carbowax is polyethylene and glycol. Uh, alternatively, in some instances, the sample can be also fixed in formalin. Once the tissue in the, in the tube is fixed, uh, then it's embedded in paraffin uh, to create cell blocks, and the cell blocks are sectioned and stained with h &E like any other uh, surgical uh, samples would be. So why is it important to do molecular testing, and why do we need to do it or want to do it from cyto cytology material? Well, molecular diagnostics is extremely important for patient management, in particular uh, to decide the extent of surgery, uh, how much tissue needs to be excised, and to determine which targeted therapies are available uh, for a particular patient in a particular clinical situation. And why we would like to do this from cytology? Well, there are certain lesions that otherwise would not be accessible, such as I already mentioned thyroid lesions, thyroid nodules, or any other sites that are prone to uh, heavy bleeding. Metastatic lesions uh, are often sampled by cytology. Um, and also, cytology, the cytological approach is, is uh, uh, suitable for patients who um, cannot tolerate more aggressive approach with other comorbidities. And some patients simply do not want to be subject to very aggressive tissue collection protocols. 
So um, currently, the College of American Pathologists uh, recommends that all tissue, uh, all molecular testing from cytology is done on cell blocks. And this is done because of the fear that um, diagnostic material on the slides would be used up and nothing would be left uh, for uh, in, the archi in the archives. So how is the molecular testing done on cytology uh, cell blocks? Well, they're prepared, as I mentioned before, and then they're sectioned in five to uh, eight sections. Uh, the first section is stained with h and &E and examined by pathologists for the areas that are suitable for uh, molecular testing. And the subsequent slides are then uh, transposed and the areas that correspond to the, uh, uh, the designed, uh, to the uh, area that's chosen by pathologists is microdissected and then uh, used to extract a, the RNA or DNA. However, this, using this approach, uh, we encounter often insufficient cellularity. So um, then we turn into smears. So why smears? So um, usually we have more than one diagnostic smears. Usually they're like a couple, at least five or, or even more. So it's uh, perfectly feasible and OK to save one or two smears in the archives and use the rest for uh, molecular applications. Uh, actually, in my clinical practice, I often encounter situations in which I don't have enough tissue on the cell block. However, I have multiple smears uh, with diagnostic material, and I can use that five of them, we leave one or two to obtain uh, uh, data that are necessary for patient management. However, I cannot do it at the moment. Uh, at the moment, patients often refuse to get additional samples, so they're left without, uh, without a proper management. So the objective of our uh, study was to assess the feasibility of using Diffquick, or also called Romanovsky, and Papa Nicolaou stain cytological smears for molecular uh, diagnostic studies of lung non small cell carcinomas for EGFR, KRAS uh, mutation, and EML for ALS translocation, and also um, to study mutations in papillary thyroid carcinomas, in particular BRAS mutation. I will now go over more detail why we chose these lesions and why we chose these mutations. But before that, I just want to briefly uh, go over the advantages of molecular uh, testing using cytology smears. Uh, these uh, advantages, uh, advantages are listed here. So uh, if we use cytology smears, we ensure that the sample that, that we sent for molecular studies is representative of the tumor or the lesion. The, um, Cytology fixative is alcohol, and it's milder than formalin. It induces less uh, aberrations and less uh, it, it loses less um, um, is less questionable than than formalin. Um, also, when you when you use smears, that smears require less sample and can be used for metastatic disease. We can use it on samples that we already have. We already have Diffquick or, or Papa Nicolaou prepared smears, so we don't have to do any additional tissue sampling, which is beneficial for patients. And our turnaround time is much faster. Uh, one to two days, as opposed to 10 days or two weeks. So again, lesions uh, tested for molecular alterations are lung adenocarcinomas to assess available targeted therapies and thyroid uh, lesions to determine uh, the extent of surgery. So lung adenocarcinomas belong to a group of lesions that's called non-small cell uh, carcinomas. Um, lung carcinomas comprise the majority of these lesions, 55%, in some studies even more, up to 70%. The other major lesion that belongs to this non-small cell uh, category is squamous carcinoma. So here on the right, you can see that each of these subtypes uh, have a distinct set of mutations. Uh, adenocarcinoma, um, the most common mutation adenocarcinoma is KRAS, here shown in yellow in the upper right corner. The second most common is EGFR, followed by ALK translocation. 
So we are focusing on adenocarcinoma because they're most common lesions uh, sampled by cytology, most commonly seen in our practice, and we are focusing on the three most common mutations. Uh, so here I'm going to go over the uh, little bit of a details about uh, the uh, mutations that we are testing. So KRAS um, is present in 15 to 30 percent of uh, non-small cell carcinomas, adenocarcinomas, uh, in particular point mutation involving codon 12, 13, or 61. This point mutations uh, impair intrinsic uh, GTPase activity of KRAS which renders the uh, KRAS then constitutively active. It uh, keeps uh, GTP bound, and it keeps firing to the downstream, downstream signal, signals. Uh, KRAS is downstream of EGFR, and it's therefore refractory to EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So if the, if the lesion is positive for, for KRAS, it would not be suitable for treatment with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, aimed at uh, EGFR. Uh, the second mutation uh, is EGFR. 90% uh, of these mutations uh, comprise small in-frame deletions of exon 19 or point mutation in exon 21. Um, this renders EGFR receptor hyperactive or constitutively active, and these mutation are, mutations are sensitive to tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and they uh, uh, prolong a progression-free uh, survival, typically to from 4 to 16. The last mutation that we tested in lung is ALK translocation. It's present in 5% of, of tumors. This is actually a fusion protein that's composed of anaplastic lymphoma kinase uh, catalytic domain fused to promoter from uh, EML4. Therefore, the catalytic domain is overexpressed. Uh, these uh, tumors with ALK translocation respond to chrysotinib, which is a small molecule inhibitor. Um, just a few words about EGFR receptor. So EGFR is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase receptor which gets activated upon uh, ligand binding and dimerize, and this induces the uh, catalytic activity of the intracellular part. And it, as you can see here on the slide, all the mutations that we are testing are actually present in the uh, catalytic domain. So one, once EGFR um, receptor is activated, it induces, it induces cell proliferation, differentiation, motility, and survival. Um, so, uh, patients with tumors that have EGFR mutation are most commonly female, as you can see here on the slide highlighted in red. Uh, they are patients who, ne majority of these patients never smoked, and of course, majority have uh, uh, lesions that are classified as adenocarcinomas. Now, a few words about KRAS. KRAS is a, a membrane-bound uh, GTPase. It's a downstream uh, signal uh, from uh, EGFR receptor. Uh, it's uh, constitutively active and when mutated. Most common point mutations, as I mentioned already, are uh, in amino acid acquisition uh, 12, 13, and 61. Um, patients who have KRAS mutations frequently have, uh, uh, frequently uh, are associated with smoking. Uh, they are also frequently uh, uh, of African-American ancestry. And KRAS, just like EGFR, is associated with cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation. Again, a few words about EML, uh, EML-ALK. This is a cytoplasmic uh, fusion protein composed of EML promoter and catalytic domain of ALK. It is associated, again, with proliferation and metastasis and tumors that have uh, this uh, EML translocations are usually young males who never smoked and of Asian ancestry, ethnicity. So uh, now we know about seven uh, uh, variants of EML ALK uh, translocation. And this translocation, tumors with this translocation, again, are sensitive to uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor of chrysotinib. 
switching briefly to thyroid carcinomas, uh, most common thyroid carcinomas uh, are made out of, of uh, follicular cells. The most common cancer is papillary thyroid carcinoma, comprising up to 80% of thyroid cancers. The second most common is follicular carcinoma, comprising about 10%. And there are two other cancers that are really rare, uh, medullary carcinoma, uh, which is composed of, um, which, which accounts for about 5% of cancers, and a very, very rare anaplastic carcinoma. So we focused our study on thyroid carcinomas because they're most common, and we focused on the analysis of most common mutation in thyroid papillary carcinoma, as you can see here, is BRAF. Uh, so we focused on the particular BRAF mutation, which is V600E. Uh, which is a, a substitution of valin to glutamate at the uh, residue 600. This mutation, this particular mutation, is associated with extranodal uh, extension, thyroid extension, uh, positive nodes, distant metastasis, and it turns out to be independent predictor of treatment failure and tumor recurrence. So again, to summarize, uh, we looked at lung adenocarcinomas and thyroid papillary carcinomas and we tested EGF point mutations in exon 20, 21, and in prime deletion in exon 19, uh, KRAS point mutations in codons 12, 13, and 61, and EML, EML uh, for ALEC translocation. And in thyroid, we focused on papillary carcinoma and VRAS V600E point mutations. Uh, our study was approved by our local Montefiore Einstein RRB, and the cases were selected from the archives of Department of Pathology. And we only worked with cases uh, that had multiple smears, so there was enough tissue uh, uh, that remained in our archi archives. We collected 31 lung adenocarcinomas, 21 papillary thyroid carcinomas, 18 were a classic variant, and six were a follicular variant. And we also had two follicular thyroid carcinomas. As I mentioned earlier, these are rather rare. So now uh, I will uh, give this uh, to Dr. Goswami, who will continue the presentation. He will describe in detail the methodology uh, that we used to detect the molecular alterations that I uh, just outlined. So in order to better understand this uh, process, this slide outlines a, the critical need of a pathologist to look at the region in the smear where there are good cells which can be um, interrogated by molecular diagnostic methods. This is, this is important because in the smear there are some cells which are good and there are small, some small cells which are necrotic. So it is important for someone to look at those slides and identify the good cells, which we can now further interrogate for molecular diagnostic purposes. So basically what we do is a pathologist identifies the region in the smear, which is usable for molecular diagnostic testing. And that part is scraped out and put into the slide, uh, put into a tube while the rest of the material is kept back in the archive for future testing if needed. Okay, let's move on. So for the uh, mutation detection, we utilize a technology called Q-clamp technology we, um, from a com company called Dicata. We procured the reagents from them and we utilized the Q-clamp technology to determine both single base mutations as well as in-frame deletions that Maya just mentioned. In this test, the uniqueness of this test is that while performing real-time PCR, the wild-type component of the, um, of the cells do not get amplified. The wild-type DNA does not get amplified, whereas the mutant gets amplified, as is, as is visible in the amplification curve. When there is no clamp, there is, um, there is a um, decent PCR reaction uh, giving rise to a good amplification curve. 
Whereas if you put wild type DNA and offer the clamp, there will be no, there will be no PCR product formed. This is absolutely important for um, working with a small number of cells and particularly ones which have a smaller number of cells which are mutant. Case in point, in, in the gold standard sequencing today, the, you need to have at least 400 cells which are um, uh, available for molecular diagnostic testing and out of them 10%, which is about 40 cells out of 400, should be mutation positive for them to convenient, for, for them to convincingly say that it is mutation positive. In our case, using this technology, we've been able to achieve much better. We can detect um, as few as 50 cells, a single cell which is mutant in as few as 50 cells can be detected by this technology. This, I believe, is a big improvement over the current um, you know, gold standard method of sequencing. Uh, so going over to um, the technology that we used for the EML4 ALK translocation, we used a process, called, a process of uh, QRT-PCR, and we designed primers, uh, two pairs of primers, one in the five prime end and one in the three prime end, and we performed QPCR um, from the FNS smeared uh, RNA extracted from the FNS smears. Um, if you remember, Maya mentioned that the FNS smears are stained, are fixed with alcohol as opposed to paraformaldehyde. Alcohol fixed uh, cells are much um, more, um, uh, much better for RNA extraction and for, uh, working with that. The FFPE samples are usually stained with, are uh, usually fixed with paraformaldehyde or formaldehyde. This causes the RNA to get degraded, as um, anybody who works in the field knows that FFP RNA is often degraded and very difficult to work with. On the other hand, in these smears, which have been uh, fixed with alcohol, we were able to get fairly good quality of RNA from as few as 50 cells, and we were able to look at the translocation by looking at the um, QRT-PCR on those samples. So the process here is, a, we have two sets of primers, one in the five prime end and one in the three prime end, and in a wild type sample where there is no mutation, when there, where there is where is though there is no translocation, usually we don't get any signal because normal lung or no, normal um, tissue do not express um, uh, ALK at all. So only in those uh, samples where there is an EML4 ALK translocation, we would see a an ALK expression. And that too, only in the three prime end. The five prime end will not be visible. So thereby, looking at the two curves, uh, the amplification curves, we can determine a wild type sample, which has um, some ALK expression, and a translocated sample, which has a larger amount of the three prime end of the ALK sample. Again, using this technology, we were able to detect as few as 50 cells in a smear, and um, as few as 50 cells in a smear and as few as a single cell in that 50 cell um, containing um, the, uh, the translocation. Uh, so now uh, to expand this a little further, for the, uh, the top two panels, A and B, describe the mutation detection, whereas the bottom two panels, C and D, describe the translocation detection. So going back to the uh, Q-clamp technology, once we utilized um, the Q-clamp technology, we were able to see the difference. If you if you look at the panel B, in panel panel B there was a mutant a, a mutant sample, and in panel A there was a non mutant wild type sample. So in the wild type sample, the clamp and no clamp have more than 10 CT difference, whereas in the sample that had the mutation there was about four to five CT um, uh, difference. Similarly, if if you look at um, the panel at the bottom and the panel at the bottom which is C and D, the C is wild type reference RNA, where the differences that you see in the three prime and the five prime primer are due to primer efficiencies, whereas the more than 10 CT difference is observed between the three prime and the five prime peaks, uh, the five prime curves in a sample that has the translocation. Using this methodology, we were able to, de to detect, um, like I said before, we were able to detect as few as 50 cells uh, bearing a single Mutant, uh, mutant or translocation, uh, translocated cell. Now, um, um, going back to uh, the to the technologies once again, um, the in the in the wild type in the wild type DNA, 
when the DNA polymerase is extending the forward primer at the three prime end, if there is an XNA probe, which has a 100% match with a wild type sequence, there will be no PCR product formed. Whereas in the mutant DNA, where the XNA probe does not match very well, even with a single base pair difference, it will not fit very well and there will be an amplification product. So this is the basics, basis of the Q-clamp technology which we used in our work. And at the, at the bottom in, uh, in B, we have the idea of designing two primers, two sets of primers, one at the three prime end, very close to the poly A tail of the mRNA, and one at the five prime end, away from the um, uh, from the um, ALK fusion site. The fusion site is marked with an arrow, and like Maya mentioned, there are about uh, six to seven different kind of fusion um, proteins that are known. So utilizing this technology, we were able to identify all of them. However, one of the weaknesses of our technology in, in both the mutation detection and translocation is that we are unable to find out what the mutation precisely is. We just know the presence or absence. And if it's same for translocation, we know that it is um, either present or absent. And Maya can tell this better to you, that currently the um, actual mutation does not determine um, what drug uh, differences will be given. Same with the translocation. Okay. So um, I think I will give this over to Dr. Okte to continue with the results section. Thank you. So, um, so I will go over the results. Uh, the results of our study will appear soon in the Journal of Molecular Diagnostics. So if you want to uh, go through this in detail, uh, I will uh, refer you to that publication. So this slide summarizes the um, clinical and pathological characteristics of our uh, cohort, lung adenocarcinoma cohort. In the under B, um, you can see that the average patient age was uh, 70, so they were quite, quite old patients. Um, most of them were women, 61%. Um, average tumor size was quite large, uh, four centimeters. Many patients, 74% of them uh, had uh, local metastases, and more than half of them, 58, had distant metastases as well. And out of this um, 31 patients, we detected 80, in 80% 80 of them, we detected mutation. And the next slide uh, summarizes in detail the mutation that we found. So in the left part of the, of the table shows the, uh, the mutations that were found by uh, sequencing in the reference laboratory. EGFR mutation, KRS, as well as uh, EML out translocation that was detected by uh, FISH. And the right part of the table shows uh, the results from our laboratory. So I would like to emphasize that uh, when we compare our results with reference laboratory, there was 100% concordance rate. Um, we detected all the mutations that were detected by the reference laboratory. However, we detected additional mutations. For example, if you look under patient number four, um, the uh, reference laboratory detected a mutation in KRS in codon, codon uh, 12, and we detected that one. And in addition, we detected uh, EGFR mutations in uh, exons 19 and 21. Similarly, for patient five, uh, there was no mutation detected by reference laboratory, and we detected mutation KRAS in codon 12 and so forth for patients 13, 17, 18, 19, uh, 25, 28, and 30. So uh, this was rather uh, interesting to us and, in, and, and important. Uh, it indicates that our uh, technology is, is uh, a bit more sensitive than what's out there right now. Um, so another interesting point that I want to mention here is that um, we detected uh, several mutations in the single tumor, and so far in literature has been published that, uh, that the mutations are mutually exclusive. In other words, if there is a mutation in, the EG in EGFR, uh, there would not be mutation in KRAS. However, we have three cases here in which we found a mutation in EGFR code 19, 
and KRAS uh, COVID-12. And then we also had two cases in which we found mutation in, in KRAS COVID-12 and also translocation in EML, and one case in which we find, found three uh, molecular alterations. We found EGFR mutations in COVID-19 and 21, uh, mutation and also mutation in KRAS quarter 12. Uh, so here's the summary of the comparison between our laboratory and reference laboratory, our laboratory in A, reference in B, and lab comparison in C. So you can see here that we detected more EGFR uh, mutations than the uh, reference laboratory. We detected 41% mutations, while the reference laboratory detected 19 the percentage of mutations uh, detected for KRAS is similar between our laboratory and the um, and the reference laboratory, and so is the EML translocation. So uh, if you look at C, uh, there are no cases that were positive in reference laboratory and negative in our laboratory. However, there are quite a few cases uh, that, were, that were negative in reference laboratory and positive in our laboratory. Uh, now switching uh, to a thyroid cohort, here's the summary of the cohort. Average age was younger as expected, I was 52, also as expected uh, there were more women, which usually have more uh, regions than men, um, tumors were smaller than lung was 2 centimeter, and we um, saw as expected uh, more papillary thyroid carcinomas than follicular cancers. Uh, papillary thyroid cancer's classical variant uh, was 65% and the follicular variant 27 and only 8% uh, were, were follicular cancers. Um, again, in this cohort also we detected uh, there was 100% concordance between us and the reference laboratory. However, we did not send many samples to reference laboratory. We sent uh, seven samples, five of which were positive in reference laboratory in our laboratory and two were negative. Um, interesting point to mention here is that we detected uh, mutations in DRAF in 81% of cases, which is significantly higher than reported in literature. Um, in literature, uh, the mutation rate reported is 50%. So to summarize, um, qPCR clamp method is suitable for mutational analysis. Uh, and translocation analysis for both uh, paraffin-embedded tissue as well as cytology smears. Uh, we applied it successfully uh, and uh, obtained high sensitivity. We obtained 1% mutation detection level in as few as 50 cells, which is uh, much more significant compared to what's used uh, in reference laboratory uh, today. They need 400 cells and with a 10% mutation rate. Uh, we detected more uh, DRAF mutation, 81% compared to the reference laboratory, and we also co uh, detected 90% more um, uh, adenocarcinomas with uh, mutations more than the, than the standard uh, technique. However, I also would like to point to certain um, limitations and uh, not problems, but certain things that we need to pay attention to. Um, the, so our method is uh, ultra-sensitive method. We detect mutations that are present in minority of cells, in very few cells. So if one would try to treat patients based on, based on um, the mutation that's present in very small proportion of cells, uh, one may not find, uh, it may, this may not be clinically detectable. So the, the, the response to targeted therapy may not be clinically detectable. However, this um, small proportion of cells may be a seed for future development of tumor for, for uh, recurrence, let's say that way. Um, so that's why College of American Pathologists, or CAP, recommends that we use two-tier uh, testing strategy in which we will first apply uh, the standard, um, standard technology, uh, which detects uh, uh, mutations in 10% of cells, not less than that, and then uh, we apply also highly sensitive uh, methodology to uh, be alert on potential subpopulation of cells that have other mutations for potential future testing or future therapies. So the final conclusion, uh, qPCR clamp technology and qRT-PCR approach can be successfully used to detect targetable mutations from cytological smears of lung and thyroid carcinomas and this approach represents an ultra-sensitive technology which would be increasingly needed 
as smaller amounts of diagnostic material and mutations in minority of cells with the tumor become available. So I would end with that, and uh, we open uh, we open for questions. Thank you. Thank you for that informative presentation. I'm Julia Chad of Lab Roots, and I will be moderating the following question and answer session. Before we get started, I would like to tell our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is, do you consider this technology better? We are trying to arrange so we can both answer questions. So here's Dr. Goswami. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. Like I mentioned in the um, in the talk, um, I believe that this technology is definitely very helpful because um, uh, previously many of the patients could not benefit from this uh, um, uh, benefit from this approach. Um, whereas uh, today, we, um, with this technology, they should uh, many pretty much all the patients can benefit from uh, uh, the mo molecular diagnostic I approach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just see. Um, so perhaps I can add to to this. Um, in in my practice, I often see uh, uh, cases in which uh, we don't have enough tissue in the cell block. Really often, but we have enough on smears, and I get calls from treating physicians. Um, to to assess mutational status, which I cannot, so I have to go back to them and say we need additional tissue, and then the patients refuse to have another procedure. So that happened multiple times. So if I can use um, several of my smears and send them for molecular testing, that will be extremely extremely useful. Patients will would be able to get diagnosis, and they will be able to get targeted treatment that are now not available for them because there's no material and they're not either, either they don't want to have additional procedures or sometimes there are co comorbidities and they just cannot, cannot tolerate additional procedures. I, I hope uh, that answers your question. That answers your question. That answers your question. The next question. Did you test all those mutations in one multiplex reaction with QClamp or in individually which would use more DNA? So for the time being, we have done all of these individually because we had, this is more of a proof of principle kind of an experiment. But um, at a later date, we do plan to go multiplex, though um, multiplexing them will have its own uh, set of complex issues. But right now, we have all done only um, them individually. However, we have used um, very sensitive methods of you know, qPCR and very small volumes um, in order to go down to the number of cells that uh, we have used. Yes, but for now, we've only used a uh, single. What control do you use to make sure the negative and wild type is not a false negative in a positive sample with QClamp? Okay, um, for uh, controls, um, as, Ma, as uh, Dr. Octa mentioned in, in our paper, we have used cell lines that are known to have mutations and cell lines that are known not to have mutations. Since it's a 100% uh, nearly 100% population of the cells, either bearing or not bearing the mutation, we have used them as controls, both positive and negative, in our um, test in order to determine the false positive and the false negative status. So we diluted. Well, yeah, we diluted the cell lines with um, the mutant positive cell lines with the uh, mutation negative cell lines and used them as controls. Have you used QClamp with liquid biopsy samples? Yeah, uh, we have not personally done this. But Diakata, the company from whom we have bought the reagents, 
they have uh, performed some experiments and I have heard that it's working in liquid biopsy and um, they would be publishing it soon. But we, we have not done this. We, we uh, tend to focus on the smears because, as I mentioned in the talk, um, uh, if you take the FNA directly, um, there would be a lot of, um, you know, degraded cells and there'll be a lot of, you know, necrotic tissue. And we wanted to make sure that we are working with good quality uh, material. So we wanted to stick to the smears where um, somebody has looked at it under the microscope and marked regions where the cells are good. So we wanted to focus on that. But like I mentioned, the company has done it. There are no more questions. I would like to thank, again, Dr. Gwaswami and Dr. Afte for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? Um, no, I think, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. And I believe that um, um, this technology, we will be able to take it further and hopefully someday soon, it will be available for uh, clinical practice. Yeah, same thing. I completely concur with Dr. Goswami. I'm hoping to see this in clinical practice very soon. It will be extremely helpful uh, and many, many patients would benefit. Thank you. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through six months from the live date. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward this announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time and goodbye.